Every time a grand tour comes around, the cycling media chooses their favourites and the bookies back them up. Carapaz, Almeida, Lopez and Bardet are just a few of those who would lead the charge to Verona in the 2022 Giro d'Italia. But what if they missed someone? What if there was a dark horse waiting for a chance of redemption? We're going to dive into this year's Giro and see where Jai Hindley won the race and where his competitors lost it. Jai Hindley is the Bora Hansgrohe rider who held the Malia Rosa in 2020, only to lose it in the final time trial to Theo Gagan Hart in a moment of heartbreak. He was coming into the 2022 Giro off the back of a solid Torino Adriatico, where he finished fifth behind the defending Tour de France champion Tadej Pogacar. Nobody outside of Bora Hansgrohe was touting him as the potential winner, and even then, he was only one of three options alongside Wilco Kelderman and Emmanuel Buchmann. Not only would he have to race against his competitors, but he would also have to prove the strongest of his teammates. Stage 1 of the 2022 Giro started as all Grand Tours do, unbearable tension, super fast speeds and a no holds barred finish. While Mathieu van der Poel took the stage win and Caleb Ewan hit the deck, Wilco Kelderman came out on top of the general classification contenders, laying down a marker within his own team that he should be the protected rider. Kelderman backed up this performance in the time trial on stage 2, as he came in first of the Bora Hansgrohe GC contenders. But a bigger issue was presenting itself. Simon Yates, winner of the 2018 Vuelta a España, stormed to a commanding win. Over a distance of only 92 kilometres, he managed to beat Mathieu van der Poel, put 5 seconds into the former world time trial champion Tom Dumoulin, and a further 17 seconds into Kelderman. Richard Carapaz had lost 28 seconds, and Jai Hindley was a further 6 seconds behind him. In a few short and flat stages, Simon Yates was already stamping his mark on the race. Stage 4 finished on the summit of Mount Etna, and was the first big test of this year's Giro. At this stage, it didn't seem like Bora Hansgrohe were going all in on GC. With an early break up the road and GC contenders content to let it stay that way, Bora Hansgrohe's Leonard Kemner and Trek Segafredo's Juan Pedro Lopez battled it out for the stage win. Kemner took the win and Juan Pedro Lopez was propelled into the Malia Rosa. Now at this stage, Juan Pedro Lopez was an unknown quantity and the pre-race favourites wouldn't want to give him too much time. We don't have to look too far back to remember underdog riders like Thomas Werkler leading a Grand Tour well into the final week. But for Bora, were they looking for GC or stages? Yes, a stage win can take the pressure off a team, but you rarely see teams that are fully confident in their general classification chances sending valuable mountain domestiques up the road for stage wins. Back in the bunch, it wasn't all plain sailing for the main contenders either. Vincenzo Nibali lost two and a half minutes on his main rivals, and Simon Yates crashed early in the stage. He seemed unscathed and went on to finish with the other GC riders, but he had hurt his knee, and it remained to be seen how much damage he'd done. As is so often the case, these early stages aren't necessarily where you can win the race, but they are where you can lose it. When do three team leaders become one? That was the question facing Bora Hansgrohe on stage 9 of the Giro, where we would see the first straight shootout between GC contenders on the final climb to Monte Blockhaus. With over 5,000 metres of climbing in the stage, the final mountaintop finish is brutal. The climb of Blockhouse is listed as 13.7 kilometres at 8.5%, reaching over 10% for long stretches at the end. However, when measured from the bottom of the valley, the climb is a frightening 26 kilometres long. Ineos set the pace, and this textbook mountain train was played to perfection. Richie Port led with Carapaz on his wheel, and with under 5 kilometres to go, he launched. Initially, only Bardet and Landa are able to follow, and the Malia Rosa lost contact. Juan Pedro Lopez was dropped. Importantly, the rider who lets the wheel go is Jai Hindley. There are two Bora Hansgrohe riders in the group, and neither responds initially. Perhaps Jai wasn't able to follow the acceleration, or perhaps he was conserving energy. Jai Hindley measured his effort and slowly came back up to the leaders, using Almeida to help reel them in. He launched around the final bend and took the sprint with a huge effort. Yes, Hindley took the sprint on top of a very difficult climb, but he did not show he was capable of putting time into his rivals. Yet. Meanwhile, Simon Yates dropped out of contention for the overall, losing 11 minutes. If there's one thing we should know by now, it's that winning bonus seconds is important. It helps you on the general classification, but it also forces riders to waste energy hunting bigger gaps to make up for the bonuses they've lost out to you on the sprints. Jai Hindley was arguably the most shrewd of all the general classification riders, sitting back and taking bonus seconds in the sprints without spending too much energy on attacks. For example, on stage 14 of the Giro, 
Bora Hansgrohe began to rip the race apart as they raced towards Torino. On the climb of Superga, Richard Carapaz spent his energy breaking the front group with a searing attack. Juan Pedro Lopez was dropped and Carapaz opened up a 30 second gap. But once he was caught, Jai Hindley put the effort in to take the bonus seconds in the final sprint. He did the same on stage 16, the queen stage of this year's race, where there were only 7 seconds between himself and Richard Carapaz on GC. As the race lulls, Bilbao and Lander crash, which delays Jai Hindley. But he's back with the leaders in no time, and Lander even attacks with 10km to go, forcing a select group of podium riders clear. And at the finish, Jai Hindley makes sure to win those bonus seconds in the sprint. On the other hand, why did Richard Carapaz sprint on stage 17 and stage 19 when there were no bonus points on offer? Without doubt, stage 20 was the most important stage of this year's Giro, and it really showed the importance of teammates acting as relays. Stage 20 had three big Dolomite climbs, and only three seconds separated Richard Carapaz and Jai Hindley on the general classification. It seems that Bora Hansgrohe had bided their time to the last mountain stage and absolutely aced the strategy. Ineos played their usual cards and rode a hard tempo on the front, dropping Bora's number two, Emmanuel Buchmann. But an alternative reading could be that they were trying to deter attacks rather than set up Carapaz for one of his own. Hindley attacked first on the Paso Fidea, and only Richard Carapaz could follow. This doesn't look like an all-out effort, to be fair. His face looks surprisingly calm here. But what this attack did do was link Hindley up with his teammate Leonard Kemner. Kemner was a terrific teammate on the day, and the next few minutes demonstrate why. With Hindley on his wheel, he put in one huge effort for around one kilometer, and he actually managed to drop Carapaz inside the final three kilometers. Kemner pulls off, and Hindley puts the hammer down, and it cracks Carapaz, who's even passed by Lander and Nibali. But what does that show? that he went as deep as possible to stay with Hindley with no thought to damage limitation. In that moment, it was all or nothing, but it wasn't enough. In the end, Hindley took one minute and 28 seconds on Carapaz. He later said, I knew that I had one bullet and if I fired, I had to make it count. Could it be that if Richard Carapaz and Ineos had been more conservative on the climb, he might have had enough energy to go with Hindley? The final stage was the last hurdle. It was where Jai Hindley had lost the Giro to Theo Gagan Hart back in 2020, but this was going to be a reckoning and a redemption. His 1 minute 25 gap to Carapaz on the general classification was a much better cushion than 2020. Carapaz would need to take back a whopping 5 seconds per kilometre, and based on the performance from Stage 2's time trial, where Carapaz only beat him by 6 seconds, it would take a disaster for Hindley to lose the lead. He said, With the experience of two years ago, I was a little bit less nervous. I've thought about that day for a long time out training. In the end, Hindley lost only 7 seconds. Bora Hansgrohe has invested a lot of time and energy into helping Hindley get better at time trialling, spending time in the wind tunnel with Specialised and working on specific training with a time trial bike in mind, and it showed. Those are the key moments where the 2022 Giro d'Italia was won. We hope you enjoyed this video. If you have, let us know by hitting the thumbs up and then telling us if you agree with our analysis. Where do you think Jai Hindley won the race? Finally, make sure to subscribe to Velon for more behind the scenes content from the world's best cycling teams.